Hello, and welcome back to the Money Advantage podcast. This is Rachel Marshall and Bruce Wayner. Bruce, thank you for joining me again on this lovely Wednesday. How are you today? Yeah, good morning. Uh, it's, it's Wednesday today, but who, who knows when people are going to listen to this? You know, it's true. And I should say it's March 2022. You might be listening and it's 2025. Imagine that. Um, but this podcast is something that is timeless and shall we say ageless. And we're going to be really digging into this big question, which also is a fine point question. What is infinite banking? Let's give a little bit of backstory and context for why we're coming at this topic that we've been discussing. I mean, Bruce, for four and a half years now on this show and both of us before that, but Perhaps you are new to the concept. Maybe you have heard the term infinite banking and you're looking for some more factual, hard facts, bare bones. What exactly is infinite banking? How does it work? And that's your angle of coming into this conversation today. Or perhaps you have been using infinite banking for a while and you say, I love it. I love what it's doing for me, but I can't exactly articulate how the pieces are working and moving together. Maybe I wanna explain it better to my spouse or my kids or my grandchildren. I want them to get on board with using this in their own life. Or maybe I'm just talking with a coworker or a friend or I'm at that barbecue in the backyard and I really wanna be able to help somebody to understand what you, what I, you know about infinite banking so it can improve their life as well. So really today we're talking about the basics of infinite banking, we're gonna be covering, I said 16, what questions, you know, Bruce and I never can um, get through all of those topics in the short, compact way that we want to with a show. We always have such great content to be able to add and, and questions to answer for you. So we're probably not gonna get through all 16 today, but we are gonna be talking about these what questions about infinite banking so you can see what it is and how it works. And now, Bruce, before I say anything more, I would love for you to talk about just the, the perspective of why this is beneficial for somebody who maybe has been doing infinite banking for a long time as well. Yeah, although I've been uh, in the whole life world since the 80s, the infinite banking world um, since about 12 years ago, when we first met Nelson Nash and Carlos Lara and Bob Murphy, and as we continue to do reviews, uh, people are always excited, and I tell people that uh, this is more caught than taught. Uh, mm -hmm. We do our best, our best effort to teach it, but it's amazing how you get these aha moments, and I mean from people that have had policies for 12 years, and they still have the same questions. Oh, now I understand how the dividends work. Oh, now I understand why I can borrow against the policy. So the, it's amazing how many people but, you know, I guess maybe that's not that amazing because people have this, the same thing that they get the aha moments when they look at their mortgage or when they look at a credit card statement and they see 15.99% and they say, oh, I didn't realize I was paying that much mm -hmm. or there's all kinds of aha moments. So I think what we're trying to do here is really try to, to accelerate the aha moments. I love that. And, you know, something that's really top of mind to me, I'm working with my fifth grade daughter on math this morning, and we go through this section of her Saxon math, it's mental math, and she has to solve these problems without writing them down on paper and think through a strategy to solve these concepts. And this is something we've been doing over the course of the past year. And it's amazing how much is repeated. So they're not introducing brand new ideas every single day. And I looked at her today and I said, you know, that was really easy for you compared to the first time we did it. Why do you think that is? We realized that we've probably been confronted with or presented with the same kind of problem probably 20 or 25 times or even more up to this point and realizing that all of a sudden is beginning to make sense. And sometimes things in life are just like that. You have to practice them over and over. You may not fully have a comprehension at the beginning, but the more times you do something, the better it really sinks in and begins to fully make sense. And you have those, those neurons connect the ideas together. So today we're going to start with what is infinite banking? We're going to come around to perhaps today, perhaps in another show, what infinite banking is not. What can I do with infinite banking? What is infinite about infinite banking? And look, 
We would love for you to join us in this conversation. If you have questions about anything regarding infinite banking, we would love to hear what your thoughts and questions are so that we can incorporate your questions and be able to answer them very specifically. You might find what you what's on your mind and what you're thinking about already answered today, or you might have additional questions that you would love for us to help you unpack. So Bruce, let's just go ahead and dive straight in and we could cover these in a very brief way, but really my goal is today to give a compact answer, then flesh that out a little bit to show what that means and then really bring it into, okay, well, here's the tactical, here's the feature that we're talking about. Here's the way it actually works, but let's be honest. Do you really, really, really need to know how something works or do you want to know what it does for you and what it allows you to do in your own life? And so we're going to play that balance delicately today where we're going to be talking about how something works mechanically for the purpose of really breaking down, what does that mean for you? Why is it advantageous? Why is it beneficial? What does it help you do that you couldn't do before? So Bruce, what is infinite banking? I'm gonna say the very shortest way we can say what is infinite banking is it's a strategy of using specially designed whole life insurance. Now that's just for the the snapshot in time. That's for, you know, if you were taking a tweet or an actual definition, there's the definition, a strategy of using specially designed whole life insurance. Now that's going to beg a lot of questions though. What is the strategy? What is specially designed? What is whole life insurance? And there's so many components laid out inside of there. Bruce, let's go ahead and just take it over to you. Where would you start with explaining to somebody what is infinite banking? Well, I would start by saying that uh, if, you, if you really look at um, your finances, uh, people suggest that you save anywhere between 10 and 15% of your income. Uh, but then, so if that's true and you do that, then look at the financing aspect of your life and see what percentage of that, not, not the percentage you're paying for financing, but the per overall percentage of all your fi financing. So example, let's say you're, let's say you have uh, $10,000 worth of bills that are going out every month. And one of them happens to be a $3,000 mortgage payment. Well, that's 30% mm -hmm. of your, of your bills are actually going out every month. So now 30% is greater than 10 or 15%. Mm -hmm. Car payment. Let's say you have a twelve to $1,500 car payment. So that's 12 or 15% of that that's going out. And then maybe you may have some uh, student loans. It's, you, you understand where I'm going with all this. Add, Nelson, add on the credit card. <laughs> credit yeah, cards. Well, that's yeah, that's yeah. often it can be maybe fit 40, 50 percent of your outflow per month may be financing related where you are paying an interest. Correct. So Nelson that. said your need for finance is greater than your need for saving. And so when when you really understand that, then then some people say it would say, well, then I will just pay for cash for everything. Now, when you do that then you are actually giving up that cash for uh, uh, giving up an opportunity cost of cash. In other words, you're giving up what Nelson used to say, you pay interest on everything. So now you don't pay interest for the financing, but you give up making interest on the cash. Now that hasn't been as big a deal, but I can actually show a person mathematically why it's still a big deal. But as interest rates are going up right now, we're losing out even more and more. So, and the basic reality is your need for finance is greater than your need for saving. But in, it, but in infinite banking, you take care of both of those because you mimic the banks. And so you are both saving and financing through this strategy. I love how you brought that out. And I don't think we've talked ever on the show about that specific idea. So if you're listening, you could be saying, that's a lot to wrap my brain around. I'm saving money over here and I want some kind of growth rate on that savings. And yet I also am financing a majority, perhaps, 
of my lifestyle expenses and I'm paying an interest rate on that money, or if I'm paying cash, I'm giving up the ability to earn interest on that money. And either way I pay cash or I finance, I have an opportunity cost or I have an interest cost. I'm either paying interest or I'm giving up the ability to earn interest. So the idea then is if you're using infinite banking, you're saving and storing capital where it is working well for you, you're getting a good growth rate, you're getting safety and liquidity. And we'll talk about all those things and unpack them a little later. You're doing a great job with your savings storage location. And at the same time, you're continuing to earn interest while you are paying for things that you're financing. So that's why Bruce is saying you're doing both. You're handling your financing need at the same time as handling your savings need. I think that's a lot to wrap our, our brain around. So what this whole thing allows you to do, what infinite banking puts in your lap or in your hands is this ability to model the bank and act like the bank and control capital. And that's at the core of why it allows you to finance well and save well, because you're in a position of controlling capital like the bank does. And we have a whole episode unpacking what the rules of the bank are and how you model the bank. But if you just separate yourself for one moment from the bank and you look at two players, two parties in each transaction of financing, you realize that the bank controls the capital. They provide you capital in the form of a loan for which you are gonna pay them interest back. And when you look at the dynamic and the equation, because they control capital, they're able to charge interest. And they're in a position of being able to earn interest while they're putting their money to work. They're in the position of being able to discriminate ab about two different loans. Which one are they going to provide to a consumer? Probably the one that's lower risk and most likely to be repaid. And they're in a position of continuing to grow their wealth because they control capital and everyone has a need for capital. And instead of just being that other party where the bank is the one in control and we're at the mercy of the bank's lending practices, we can instead be that financer and be in the position of control when we have capital. Bruce, is there anything else you wanna say on that piece? No, just being in control is something that um, of all the business owners I talk about, talk to and I talk to a lot of them that is the that is the thing that they they understand the greatest and why they like infinite banking because they are in control of the asset um, we talk about you know you could do the same strategy with um, a, a HELOC on your on your house well, but there's pros and cons of that one of the cons is you're not in control of the repayment terms you're not in control of whether you can even take a loan. So control should be the underlying thought throughout this whole process. Absolutely. So if we answer to say, what is infinite banking by, well, it allows you to have a strategy for using specially designed whole life insurance. I think the natural next place that my brain wants to go is that if we're gonna use terms like this in our definition, well, we need to define all of those terms to really make sure that we're on the same page and that there's a full understanding. So without assuming that you know or don't know something, let's unpack the very basic terminology of what exactly is whole life insurance. Mm -hmm. Now I'm gonna share with you the very briefest Com most compact definition of what is whole life insurance that I can. And then again, we're going to unpack this. So it's life insurance that lasts your whole life and provides cash value. Now there's so much that needs explained within that. Um, Bruce, do you want to go from here? And then I'll take a, a look at the difference between term and whole. Yeah. Whole life. Um, a lot of people don't know this, but it's, it's the original life insurance. So sometimes you'll even see it called ordinary life. Um, but it, it, it is the insurance that was actually established through need years. 
well, decades, uh, millennia ago. So mm -hmm. whole life basically will take, not basically, it does this. It takes the insurance cost and it spreads it out throughout your entire life. And, and we'll impact term insurance here. And I got a little story that just came up with a client just very recently. But, um, and as it does that, you are, with, especially with specially designed life insurance, and we'll talk about this in a little bit too, you're actually to, you're actually to fund it with more cash value at the beginning. So that, and that cash value is the net present value of a future death benefit. And it's both guaranteed interest and also builds with dividends. And di dividends are just part of the profits of the company. Now we hear this all the time from people that are, they poo poo whole life and they say, well, dividends aren't guaranteed, which they're not, but they've been paid by, by every good company um, for over 115 years. They also will say, well, all the definition of dividends for whole life is that they're return a premium that you would not have to have paid. So they're just returning it to you. And although that definition is correct, they don't really take it far enough. The people that are using it as a con, it's the same way with any dividend from a company. Coca-Cola or UPS pay dividends. Well, reason they can pay dividends is they're overcharging you for freight and they're overcharging you for a Coke. And, the, and when they do, they actually get profits that then they distribute to stockholders in the form of a dividend. When a whole life insurance, they're very conservative. So they're saying, we believe this is how much the insurance is going to cost. And this is how much they will not believe. They know that's how much the insurance is going to cost from their mortality tables. But we also believe this is how much we're going to have to use to run the company. If they can get better investment returns, lower mortality returns, and lower operational return, uh, expenses, then they actually can distribute the profits to the, the policyholders because it's a mutual company and the policyholders actually own the company. Mm -hmm. So they distribute those profits just like a stock company would distribute those uh, uh, profits from overcharging you for their products or services. Yes, and there's so much packed into that as well. So let's take a step to the, I don't know if it's back or sideways or forward, but let's go ahead and talk about what is life insurance. Now, I don't have the capability right now on a podcast format. I know we're also live on audio or video, but because this is produced as a podcast, I'm not going to use a visual, but I'm a very visual person. And when I learn something visually, it sticks with me forever. So I'm going to explain the verbal piece of a visual representation that I learned when I was first really grasping the concept of life insurance. So it's, it started like this. If you were to go to the store as a good shopper and you had, you're shopping for oranges and you see two oranges on the shelf and one is priced at 10 cents and the other one is priced at $30, which one looks like a better bargain, a better price? Well, probably the 30 cent orange, but perhaps, I don't even know if I said 30 cents. I think I said 10 cents. I messed up my numbers there. So why would you buy the more expensive orange is the question. Why is it even on the shelf? Why is it even sitting next to the other one if everyone is just going to buy the lower priced orange? Well, maybe what you didn't know is that the lower priced orange was grown, uh, I don't know, in a lab somewhere and it's genetically modified and it is full of all kinds of, I don't know, fertilizers and and toxins or something like that. And maybe the other one was produced as organically uh, amazing as you possibly could get. And it's juicy and wonderful and delicious. And it is a gourmet orange. I have no idea. I don't think there's gourmet oranges, but I'm just saying, let's imagine the, the 10 cent orange was gonna be very bland and dry inside and feel like it's not really, really that mouthwatering orange that you wanted. Well, there's a difference in the price and we cannot compare, you cannot just say the 
the lower price is always best because you're not looking at two things that are equal. You need to understand the difference in those two products to be able to understand the price difference. So starting from that level, let's take a look at life insurance in general. If you look at two products, I'm going to put the two extreme ends of the spectrum in terms of price. One would be term life insurance at the lowest end. So if you're just shopping for life insurance, you said, I want a $5 million death benefit. And how am I going to get the lowest price on that? I'm going to get term insurance. That's the lowest ticket price tag. Well, what are you going to get for that lowest ticket price? You're going to get term insurance. Term insurance simply means the insurance is in place for a term of time. Could be 10, 15, 20, 30 years. Those are some average um, time frames that you'll see. And what that means is if you pass away during that time frame of the term, not a day later than the term has expired, but within that time window, then your beneficiaries will receive the $5 million death benefit payout. If you pass away a minute after that policy has expired, they get absolutely nothing. Now, the other piece to look at with this is it is simply death insurance. It is truly, you have paid a premium to get a death benefit and that's all it is. Now, is it bad? No, it's not bad. We believe in having term insurance as well. Often it is a wonderful way to supplement and get all of the death benefit that you need so you can get up to what we call, what is called your human life value, as much life insurance as you can qualify for. But the challenge is if you just look at the price tag, everyone would say the bargain shopper should get term insurance every single time. We need to remember though, it is simply a death benefit and only for a limited period of time. So what is in contrast? What does that $30 orange look like in terms of life insurance? Well, at the other end of the spectrum with the highest amount of money that you could possibly pay for life insurance, you're going to see whole life insurance. What is the difference between the lowest cost and the highest cost? Well, there's infinite product design from the bottom price to the highest price that you can pay for that amount, say $5 million of death benefit. But here it's not apples to apples comparison. What is different about that higher price point for this product? Well, whole life insurance is going to last you your whole life. That means at this time, policies are being issued to age. I never remember, Bruce. Is it 120 or 121? 121. 121. So 121, which means if you live to age 121, which I don't think anyone on this planet has yet, I mean, except if you look back in the days of Noah and before that, but since that time in biblical times, since the flood, no one's lived past age 120. What they're saying is we're going to peg the end of this policy past when we think most people are going to live. However, if you did survive that and you live to be 122, the policy will pay out fully the full death benefit to you. It's called endowing during, during your life because you're still living, but at the end of that policy time frame. Bruce, am I explaining that piece well? Mm -hmm. So it's going to last your entire life. Now, in addition, you're not just getting that death benefit payout. It's not just I paid in my premium dollars. Then when I die, the death benefit is paid to my beneficiaries. That's one piece of it. However, you're also getting all these living benefits all along the way. And specifically, you are getting a cash value, which is, again, as Bruce said, the net present value of a future death benefit. It's kind of a lot to wrap your mind around. What it is, it's the equity portion of your death benefit. It's the portion that you have access to use during your lifetime, which means this is not just a product that you purchase for a death benefit. It truly is life insurance because you have the ability to use it while you're still living. And using it means I've got this cash value. It's continuing to grow. I can access it. I can borrow against it, or I can withdraw it. The better way is borrowing against it in most cases. I can pay back on my own schedule. I have the ability to use this capital for whatever I desire all along the way. And that is what makes two kinds of life insurance at these two opposite ends of the cost of the death benefit be completely different products, which is why I love whole life insurance because it's so much more than just death insurance. It truly is life insurance. 
So Bruce, is there anything else that you would say about what is whole life insurance really to have this understanding come full circle to make sure that this makes sense? Well, one of the things I don't think people realize is that the whole life insurance is based upon uh, term, term rates. So this is That's a little, really good. Yes. Yeah. So when they figure out the mortality, um, see, there used to be only one year renewable term insurance. So they would look at a 24 year old, the mortality of a 24 year old for a hundred thousand dollars in death benefit. And they would say it costs you $10. Then the next year they would say by contract, it's going to automatically renew, but, the, but now you're, you're 25 years old. And so instead of being $10, it's going to be $11. The next year, it's going to automatically renew unless you cancel it. It's going to automatically renew and it's going to be $26. And that kept on until they were 50, let's say. And and at 50, it might have been, because you're closer to your mortality, it might have been $5,000 a year. Next year, it might have been $6,500. And sooner or later, though, people never got to the they, they dropped the one year term renewable because they were like, I'm not paying $20,000 for a hundred thousand dollars of term because next year I know it might go to 25,000 and people might think I'm exaggerating right now, but that was the story I was going to bring up here in a second. So what, what the, the insurance companies did to, to get people to stop dropping the terms, they said, instead of charging 10 at 24, and 6,500 at, at 50 will smooth that out over a 30 year period and take some of that 6,500 and put it early in the contract. So now instead of being $10, it might be $30 and we will just keep it $30 out over that t- time period. So they just smooth the, the entire part out. Well, whole life has been doing that from the very beginning. Mm-hmm. So that means that if, but they're doing it to age 121. So costs get a lot higher up towards 121. So that's why the rates are the same, but the cost is higher in the early years for the same death benefit. But you're not comparing apples to apples as you already talked about, because one's going to run out and another is not going to run out. Now, some people listening to the podcast may say, well, that's not true either. Because if you have a 10-year term by contract, you can auto-renew it for 11th year. You can, but look at those rates. Those rates are going to skyrocket. And that's the part of the story I just want to tell you. We had a person call up, a 76-year-old dentist in California that has an $800,000 policy that he had been paying like $3,500 a year on. And then five years ago, it went to $10,000 a year. Hmm. And then the next year it went to 20,000 a year and then it went to 30,000. I'm generalizing here, but, but I do know this year it's over $40,000 a year for 800. And guess what? Next year it goes to $102,000 a year for 800,000. Over the next nine years, he will pay $649,000 for the one year auto renew for $800,000 of benefit. And he is just, he is despondent about this because we hear this all the time. I don't care about the death benefit. I only worry about cash value. It's funny though, he had the same ideas when he was younger and got this 30 year term policy. But now as he's 76, his views have changed. Think about you on this podcast listening. Have your views changed even over the last two or to five years. You don't have, know how your views are going to change over the next 30 years. Mm-hmm. So that's the basic difference between term and whole life is whole life is using mortality rates for term insurance. And they're smoothed out over that entire time period. So obviously you're going to be paying more because you have an asset that will pay out yes. or term insurance the only way it's going to pay out is if you're willing to continue to pay, willing and able mm-hmm. to continue to pay 
the one-year renewable cost, and that one-year renewable cost actually skyrockets, and it gets to a point where it's just not feasible. Well, and Bruce, the crazy part about that is, okay, so he's 76 now. What if he continues paying the term rates until he's 80 and then decides, well, I really, really can't keep doing this, drops and so the that's policy. A conversation. And yeah. I mean, that's, none of us want to be in that situation of saying, okay, well, this is a ridiculous astronomical cost for me to keep this term policy in force. But then you're almost feeling like, well, I've paid in this long and I have this much sunk cost, this these many dollars already into this policy. What if I let it go now and I die after I let it expire? And the challenge with this is in the industry, we know that only about one to two percent of policies of term policies actually end up paying out because of this exact reason. People either drop the policy, say, I don't need the life insurance anymore, or they um, pass away after that term then either it's been converted to a, a permanent product or it's been dropped altogether. And so for the consumer, then you look at that and you can say, well, I had peace of mind during the policy being in force, but I got no other benefit. Meaning it was a cost to me. When you look at whole life insurance, though, you're building equity, you have cash that you can use. And when you use it for infinite banking, the opportunities are infinite as we'll talk about further on in this conversation. But when you look at that, it makes sense. If you have a policy you're not sure is going to pay out, that is a, a tremendous cost. I believe I I believe I I actually used this analogy from one of my mentors before, but I think it's a really good time to bring it up again. So term insurance is like you're in a hot air balloon and you're going up steadily. And then when the term runs out, all of a sudden the hot air balloon catches on fire. That's when your rates go from that 5,000 a year to 40,000 a year. So now you're really high up in the air and that's like you, well, you've paid all these years and you're closer to death, just like you're going up into the heavens, you're closer to death. Now the hot air balloon catches on fire and you have to decide, well, I can't jump out because I want to get to this death benefit, but I can't keep paying all these Mm -hmm. 40,000, 65,000, 102. That's like, it's on fire. So, but you're going to probably die either way because one, you, you're going to stop the payments and not be able to have the, t- the term insurance. And that's like jumping out, jumping off the, the payment and you're going to die. I don't, mean, I don't mean figuratively die, but you're going to not have life insurance mm-hmm. or that balloon is going to totally burn up and you're going to come crashing to the ground anyway, because as in this case, this person over the next nine years, well, counting the last two years, um, it's going to pay $649,000 for an $800,000 benefit. And oh, by the way, if he lives one more year, his premiums go to like $330,000. So now he's going to actually be paying more in for the next 10 years than he's actually going to get back. I was going to point that out as well. With term, it is possible that your costs that have gone into the policy, if you keep this in force your entire life, it is possible you will actually pay more in premium than you receive in death benefit. Not even possible if you keep it in, in, in your entire life. Well, it depends on how long you live, right? I mean, but if we, if you have somebody who lives to be 91 or 107, it is not, it doesn't make any financial sense to keep a term policy in force that long. So with whole life, on the other hand, always the amount of premium that you pay into the policy is always less than your death benefit. Always. Absolutely. Always. Yes. And that's something that maybe is not as important to somebody who's just getting started wanting the the life insurance in place. It sounds like a really nice price tag right now, just 30 bucks a month. And I have this great peace of mind. But if you have long-term thinking and you want to live a full life and you zoom your lens out until you're in your nineties or even into being a centenarian, does that decision still make sense? And Bruce, for the sake of time, I'm not even sure it was funny. You said, maybe we'll get through four questions. I'm not even sure we'll move past this one, but I was going to say, I think the next question then would be to answer what is the purpose of life insurance? I mean, that's a, a what question that I think anyone would be asking right now. If, if you're saying, well, most people then get to this point of saying, 
well, yeah, but once you're 60, you don't need the life insurance anymore. The yes. home might be paid off. You yes. know, my, I'm not really planning to work that many more years. We're going to be taking social security. I don't really need life insurance. Well, that is a question that's probably weighing on your mind if you're listening and you're you're thinking, well, okay, the cost is irrelevant if I think I don't need or want life insurance past age 60 or past age 50. So Bruce, what would you say if you just had to say one sentence and then let's unpack it? What is the one sentence answer? What is the purpose of life insurance? Well, the purpose of life insurance is during your earning years is to protect your income. And that's exactly how the underwriters calculate whether you have too much or not. Now you can always have less than that, but the underwriters take an actuarial view. I should say the actuaries take an actuarial view of it. The underwriters see if you're healthy enough, the actuaries determine. So they're, they're trying to protect your income. So that's the purpose of the basic purpose of life insurance is to protect your earning ability for for whomever you wanted to protect that, whether it be a business partner, whether it be um, for your family. So protecting your earnings power. Let me now ask a follow-up question. I know, I know you're going somewhere and I hope I'm not unsteering you that way. Okay, but what is the purpose of life insurance for a person who is currently 91? What is the purpose of life insurance for that person? Maybe they're no longer earning. Well, it could be, all, yeah, it could be an altruistic uh, view where they, they want to leave a legacy mm-hmm. for generational play. But what, what people don't realize, and this is where you get into, this is where you, you get into real financial planning. Life insurance actually allows, especially a couple, actually allows you to spend more of your other assets. Yes knowing that the bucket will be filled back up for your spouse. So let's just give an example here. So let's say you have a million dollars to live off of just because it's easy math. Mm -hmm. And and you think you're going to get 4% on your money without eating into the capital. So in other words, you're going to hope that the investments are going to go up by 4%. You live off of $40,000. Next year, it goes up by 4%. You live off of $40,000, so on and so forth. But you're, and the reason you do that is you're, you're saying that, well, I don't know when I'm going to die. So what somebody, what some people say, well, you don't know when you're not going to die, but let's just say you're going to die at 90. Let's go ahead and take 5% off or 6% off. And then we're eating into that capital. So your $1 million starts to go downward. Mm-hmm. Why you're not can you just be- living off the interest anymore? Now you're eating principal. Principle. So mm-hmm. why pe- are people confident that you can do that? Well, because they know that they have a, a strategy where both spouses, or in some cases, they've decided just to have the one that's probably going to die first. And that's usually the male or somebody or, or female that has a health problem. And they then say, now we can spend more money in retirement and, and enjoy it with each other because we know when we die now, instead of that million dollars might be only worth 400,000, but now we can fill the bucket back up with another four, five, 600,000, a million dollars. And now the other spouse will be taken care of or your legacy or your mm-hmm. charitable giving will be taken care of. So it, it, people always think about it as being, for a death to protect a person for income purpose or, or to protect it, but it's really to protect you from being a living benefit to live the kind of life you want to live to now or right now, especially if it's a, if it's a spouse situation or a partner situation or a key man in the, in a partnership business mm-hmm. situation or a, a buy sell agreement. There's all kinds of reasons for that. I think, again, I mean, we have been spending, I don't know, four and a half years talking about these exact concepts. And so it's difficult to pack this all into one episode, which clearly we're not doing and, and probably better for you as a listener that we're not doing it just because it would not have made a whole lot of sense. If we just gave you one liners, you would still be left wondering, well, what exactly does that mean? Uh, So 
what I would say, if we had to pack, what is the purpose of life insurance into a nutshell? I would say that it is the foundation of a financial plan that provides you control and options. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. that can seem very ambiguous, but as you were just hearing Bruce say, there are so many things that you can do because you have life insurance when you have life insurance that if you didn't have it, that door is closed. For instance, say you have a home and it is fully paid off and you would like to give your home to your children as a legacy, as an inheritance. It's a place where you think that they're going to come back to, or they want to keep in the family somehow. That can be a very noble thought, but how many children do you have? Do they live in the same state? Do they want to live in your home? Do, is there a purpose for having your home be their location to come to? Could there be a more advantageous way to give them an inheritance that they can use and benefit you. Well, with life insurance, if you use a reverse mortgage and use your paid off home as an income stream for you, you still have the life insurance, if you have that in place, to be able to provide the legacy to your children. If they chose to keep your home, they can pay to buy back the house, or they could use the inheritance in another way. If they said, well, we'd rather use these proceeds to do something else with rather than keep the home in the family. And so That's just one option. You mentioned um, being able to have this, um, we didn't actually even go into it, but the idea that you could have it for supplemental income. We're going to unpack all of these things later, but there are so many benefits and so many options and so much control that you have by using life insurance as the key or the foundation or the cornerstone of your financial planning that is not just a death benefit. It's not just what do you need to have paid to your children and spouse and heirs if you die and do not fulfill your earning potential in years and income. It's not just that. It's what do you want to create? As soon as you say, what do you want to create? There's no more limits. There's no more, well, all I need is a $200,000 to pay off the remaining balance on the mortgage. And I need $100,000 per child to go to college because they're going to go to I don't even know what you get for a hundred thousand dollars, but let's just say that's the cost of education planning you're thinking of. Well, if those are the minimums and I'm just thinking about my working years, you can wiggle into, well, I have life insurance and the purpose of it is to just pay off the debts and that's it. But if you say, what do you want to create at any stage of someone's life? I do not know a person yet who doesn't want to have the most income for themselves at this current stage of life and the most possibilities for the future, especially if that future is a lot longer than they had planned for. And having life insurance is a tremendous advantage for that. Bruce, we've been talking way longer than we planned today. Um, I can wrap us today. Is there anything you want to pull together before I bring us to a close? No, I think um, if, you, if, you, if you see this as only a need-based strategy, then that's, that's up to you. But what I tell people all the time is need-based strategies are almost like a budget. You mm-hmm. know, it's like, okay, I got I to gotta get the bare minimum for what I'm going to spend on something. And it's just not a very fun thing to think about mm-hmm. uh, what, I, what I just barely need or or what I have to budget for this particular thing. If you expand your mind and say, this is what I want to happen. And I want to have, I want to make sure it happens. Then all of a sudden it's energizing and it, and it gets you to a place where it's exciting to talk about this. Frankly, life insurance is not exciting to most people to talk about. We, I have a, another colleague that says anytime he's on an airplane, he doesn't want to you know, talk to the person. He just says, oh, yeah, I sell life insurance. And he says he gets he, he get the rest of the flight. He just uh, he can do work and he doesn't have to talk. So it's not exciting. But if you think about what you want and what it can do as far as a want, not a need, then you're suddenly interested and you want to you want to find out whatever you can to, to implement that positive strategy in your life. Isn't that a way, way better way to live? I would rather be asking, 
to anybody, what do you want? Not what do you think is what everyone else wants for you? What do you think your limitations are? What's the time constraint? What's your energy level? What are all the things you can't do? No one wants to have conversation about that. And we really all want to say, well, let's dream together. Let's think about what is possible for us to create. And I would dare to say that it is possible to create far more than you think right now is possible. If you allow yourself to ask that question, what do I want? Not just what do I need? Bruce, I think this was a great conversation. We look forward to your questions. Unfortunately, we're not able to have this live during the conversation. So we're not able to catch your questions during the episode. But if you have questions, drop them into the chat or you can also email us at hello at themoneyadvantage.com. You can always comment before, below the YouTube video. If you're watching on YouTube, on Facebook, you can comment on LinkedIn, wherever you're watching this, or if you're listening on Apple Podcasts later as this airs, we'd love to hear your thoughts and questions. We have a lot more to unpack about this, and we're going to be diving in over the next several weeks on these life insurance basics, the fundamentals, the bare bones, reasons why to use life insurance and how it works. And we look forward to bringing you along on this journey. And I hope that it's beneficial to you as you are making decisions financially about what is best for your present and your future and what puts you in the best position of control and certainty. So with that being said, if you have direct questions for us and you want to talk about your personal financial situation, you want to get recommendations and advice for what you should do given your financial picture given your set of circumstances, given what you want to happen. And let me tell you, even if you're not 100% clear on what you want to create, we can help you by asking questions that draw that out of you to be able to really put down what is most important for you to create. So I invite you into a conversation with our advisor team to really explore what is the greatest possibility you can create in your financial life to optimize everything that you have and create the most possible with that. So we'll leave it there. Thank you so much for being part of our tribe and listening to us here at The Money Advantage. In closing, please remember success leaves clues. So model the successful few, not the crowd and build a life and business you love.